Fern Podcasts. Now I'd better perform my first duty, which is to turn on that. Good. We're on our way. Bill, thank you very much for that kind introduction and I'm absolutely delighted to be here tonight and thank you very much for all turning up. I do feel like part of the Swinburne family because my husband is an alumni of uh, Swinburne and uh, unfortunately he couldn't be here so, um, but he feels very fondly uh, about the institution and we live about 500 metres up the road so uh, we're certainly part of the Swinburne community. Now I'm scared, Bill, after that introduction, <laughs> that you are going to be intellectualising the material that I am presenting tonight. So please keep this in mind. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to questions and discussion at the end. So uh, my title, <clears throat> The Business of Football. I wanted just to start with some football history and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. But Australian rules football started in 1858, really with a guy named Tom Wills putting together the rules of this funny game which is now Australian rules football. And initially he advocated this game uh, as a way for cricketers to keep fit. I'm sure Warney would have thought that that was a good idea, but it didn't eventuate. And in 1859, he got together with his cousin and a couple of mates at a pub in East Melbourne and they formally put together the code, which was Australian Rules Football. By 1866, there were several clubs. 1877, the Amateur Victorian Football Association was established. Now, uh, I should have asked at the start, are there tons of Collingwood supporters here? Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, well, for all the rest of you... Now, where's Brendan Nottle? I saw him arrive and he has snuck away, who's a dedicated Collingwood fan, so I'm going to defer to him for any facts if he actually turns up. Uh, but, of course, you all want to know when Collingwood was established, 1892. And the Professional Victorian Football League was established in 1896 and there were... Eight, let me make sure I got that right, teams at the time. Carlton and Collingwood, of course, continue that rivalry. Essendon, Fitzroy, Geelong, Melbourne, St Kilda and South Melbourne. So, it's also interesting to note that uh, in over 100 years of operating that the AFL is the most attended sporting league in Australia. And although we're not really an international sport, as hard as we keep trying, and maybe that will occur one day, we are still the fourth largest sporting league for attendances in the world. And that's pretty impressive. And the average attendances are 35,000. I think they're starting to go up. But of course, I've got to let you know that the average attendance for a Collingwood game at the MCG is 65,000. <laughs> <clears throat> but the reason I wanted to uh, start with some of those facts was because it's important to know that Australian rules football has been part of our sport and part of our culture for a very long time. But tonight I'm going to talk a little bit more in more detail about the business of football and certainly I think is a phenomenon that has uh, gained more focus and more momentum in the more recent history of Australian rules football. And certainly looking back on some past presidents of Collingwood, I could say that uh, business is newly arrived to the Collingwood Football Club. But I want to share with you some of the inner workings of football and explore in some ways whether football is a sport or is a business. Well, my football credentials. Now, as a girl involved in footy, it's really important to have football credentials. Well, I played until I was 12. <laughs> I heard that <laughs> and I'm not repeating it. And actually the reason I stopped is because the coach told my father that the, uh, my, uh, my fellow team members were even starting to tackle me. <laughs> because at 12 you start to develop in different ways, so it was time to stop. 
But I also spent every Saturday as it was in those days, either at Victoria Park or Princess Park or Western Overall or Windy Hill or wherever it might be that Collingwood was playing. And I'd be there kicking cans before the game. I would, of course, watch the game with my family. And then I would be kicking cans after the game, waiting for my father to actually emerge from the uh, change rooms, uh, having a few drinks with the players. And of course, in those days, they used to have a few drinks at half time as well. So uh, <laughs> it was a very long day. But it was a great way to grow up. And football is certainly in my blood. I wanted to touch on, on something that a lot of people ask me, so I thought I would start with it up front, and that is how do you get to be on the board of a football club? And for many Victorians who are obsessed with football, uh, it is something that they're very keen to know about and, and interested in doing themselves. And interestingly, a lot of girls are interested in it. So uh, I have three rules in my career, and one of them is to tell people what you want. If they don't know what you want, then they can't help you actually achieve it. And I learnt this the hard way, which I won't go into tonight, but that is now one of my rules. And uh, in 2003, I was based in Perth and uh, I missed the football. I missed it because Collingwood played three times in Perth for the eight years that I was over there. I did nevertheless go to a number of games at Subiaco Oval. Unfortunately, I was often kicked out. Why? Because the West Coast fans do not appreciate anybody barracking for the opposing team, which I always did. But I certainly gained a reputation for being a Collingwood supporter. When I knew that uh, we were returning to Melbourne, I started telling everybody that I missed football and I missed the Collingwood Football Club and that I was highly motivated to become involved and make a contribution. As what, people would ask. Now, I did contemplate the cheer squad. That was a disaster and we can go into that another time. But I would tell people that I wanted to be on the board, that I thought I could make a contribution and certainly that my business experience to date as a lawyer and then in the financial sector <coughs> gave me a good foundation for being able to add value into the, into the club. So uh, after telling probably 5,000 people that this is what I wanted to do when I returned to Melbourne, I eventually ended up telling somebody who knew Eddie Maguire and who recommended me for a spot on the board. And the rest is history. So that's really how I came to be on the board. I bored everybody senseless about being on the Collingwood Football Club board. I joined in 2004 and as Bill said, um, I was the first. I haven't managed to be able to convince them to take another girl on. I'm not sure if that's because I'm doing such a great job or such a bad job. Uh, and it has been an experience. And uh, it's been suggested to me that one day I should write a book about being the first woman on the Collingwood Football Club board. I'm not sure at this stage whether that would be a drama or a comedy. And as soon as I've worked that out, I might actually start. Now, I have been one of those unfortunate people that have experienced Sam Newman saying, what the hell can a woman do on a, a, a football club board? And there are, there's loads, I said, uh, that women can do. And of course, women are involved in many facets of the club. Our best physio is a woman <coughs> in Collingwood. And increasingly, sorry, the numbers of women on boards have been increasing, particularly over the last 10 years. So it's not a new experience. Still, he doesn't believe there's any value that can be added. Uh, I was also confronted by John Elliott at lunch one day when he was still welcomed by the Carlton crowd, <laughs> who asked me, what value can somebody who has never played AFL football at professional level actually add to the board of an AFL club? It was at this point I reminded him that he had never actually played <laughs> football at a professional level and yet I'm sure he felt that he had made a contribution to Carlton. I left him pondering that one. But it is worth exploring the role of the board in an AFL club. And gender doesn't matter because it's all about business. Now, I want to start with what we don't do. We do not pick the team. <laughs> we do not recruit players. 
We do not give medical advice on player injuries. We do, however, appoint the experts who we rely on to make those decisions and we do assess their performance and we do agree their tenure. And as you all know, that is very similar to what any board would do with their executive team. I like to have notes because I could talk forever, so I'm trying to be really good here. So yes, in running a sporting club, we all get involved in the usual issues that one would expect when you're running a business. And sport, particularly AFL in Australia, is big business. Finally, I get to some business stuff. I'm sure you're all relieved. I wanted to really focus on revenue tonight because um, well, it probably gives you an idea of where our headspace is down at Collingwood. At an AFL level, revenue in 2008 was just over $302 million. And the estimated value of AFL football to the Victorian economy is in the region of $1.7 billion every year. So it's big business. AFL clubs do perform at different levels, not just on the field, but also off the field. And some of the points that Bill made in his introduction, they're fascinating. Why is it that we seem to go in these cycles of both on-field and off-field performance? Thankfully, Collingwood is one of the better performing clubs. And clubs source revenue from a number of different areas. It's actually pretty uniform, it's only the way we perform in each of those areas that makes the difference between the clubs. Now last year, because I can't give you this year's result because that would be revealing very sensitive information, uh, but last year Collingwood's revenue was $64 million. And that is a big business. Not as big as Swinburne, but it's big. And I want to just focus on what some of the main sources of revenue are because um, I think sometimes we either take them for granted or we're not really thinking about what those revenue sources could be, particularly as supporters. Membership seems bloody obvious. But the value of membership cannot be underestimated. If you are sitting here tonight as a supporter of a football club and you are not a member, go and sign up. It's really important. Not only is it one of our biggest contributors to revenue, it underpins the value that we can derive from other sources of revenue like sponsorship. How many members you have is critical to the discussions you have with your sponsors. We have about 46,500 members. It's actually a record for our club this year. Damn it that Hawthorne got the record at 50,000 for Victorian clubs and we rank about fourth because uh, actually the interstate clubs do very well with their supporter numbers and Adelaide and West Coast in particular. Not that we're competitive at Collingwood or anything but the analysis does show that we have the highest spend per member than any other club in the league. Oh, yes. Sorry, for someone like Carlton, which totally loves Collingwood, why would you sign up to a membership after what Favola has done? Just surely your players have I've a got coming to Favola, woman. Be patient. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? It's all about the players, too. I mean, the players play. Yes, it is a team effort. It really impacts on the membership impact. It does, and it becomes a personal decision and uh, if I could say from a, a, a board perspective, when players do things like that it is incredibly disappointing and incredibly frustrating because it shouldn't and it doesn't reflect the club as a whole. So all of the good work that happens gets undone. You've just taken paragraph 64 of my speech but <laughs> that's all right. Thank you for asking. So as I said, membership is strategically important and a lot of time is spent on membership. How can we recruit? How can we retain? The uh, turnover of membership can be incredibly expensive 
as you know, it's always cheaper to keep the existing members than it is to constantly look for new ones. Our churn rate this year was 83%, in terms of 83% retained. And that again is one of the highest in the league, but it can improve. At the VRC as another support, uh, another sport, their retention rate each year is 96%. And the majority of those members only go to four days of the carnival. They're not there on Saturdays in July, they're there at the Spring Racing Carnival. Nevertheless, retention, very important. This is why I have notes. We do a huge amount of member research. We do a huge amount of cutting numbers in different ways across the demographics of our members. Huge efforts in the past two years just to get people's emails. How do we communicate with our members? And in fact, a number of the research projects that we have going on at Collingwood, not with this institution, but nevertheless there's potential, <laughs> is around our membership and our membership strategies. Gate receipts. For each home game, the club who's the home game gets to collect the gate receipts. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't know that before coming to the board. I just thought you got whatever your members were. That's not the case. And therefore, of course, again, Collingwood benefits from the large crowds that it attracts. So all of these things have cumulative effects. Other teams also like playing Collingwood because if it's their home game, they get the benefit of the large crowd. I'm very sorry you told me at the start not to put my hands there and now I'm doing it, so I apologise. <laughs> to give you an idea, for the big blockbuster games, like the Anzac Day games that attract, let's say, 100,000 people, Collingwood and Essendon have agreed that we will alternate the years that we have that. The AFL doesn't decide because each of those games contributes net about $400,000 just from gate receipts alone. It's huge. And of course when we're budgeting, if it's a year when we don't have the Anzac Day game as a home game, like this year, which we lost as well, then of course you can imagine the negative impact it has on budgets. So, AFL distributions. I am guilty of saying the AFL is greedy. I am. And yet, of course, in each year, they distribute over $130 million to the clubs in cash distributions. They go in different proportions, depending on lots of different formulas. If Swinburne could work those out for us, then we'd be delighted. <laughs> and, of course, it goes to need. I'd love to say we got all of the 130 million, but we don't. But of course, the majority of that money comes from the TV broadcasting deals that are negotiated by the AFL on behalf of the clubs. So it's a very interesting relationship that the AFL can have with each of the clubs. Sponsors, they come in all shapes and sizes. I'd love to list our sponsors for you. In fact, if Eddie was here, he'd have a, one of those big things with all our sponsors' names on them. We are so lucky at Collingwood and our membership numbers play a huge uh, part in how successfully we are able to negotiate sponsors for our clubs, our club. Of course, at the moment, we're doing a huge amount of risk management, particularly around those sponsor relationships. And when you have incidents like the Favola one that actually impact the reputation of the club, guess what the number one clauses for opting out of sponsorship agreements. And when you're in difficult financial times, those sponsors are looking for, unfortunately, every opportunity to get out of those relationships. So it's an incredibly sensitive time. Now, while I'm not going to list them all, I just want you to know how creative we are at Collingwood. We try and get everything sponsored. Of course, we've got our training facility sponsored the lapel on our coach's match day shirt is sponsored. Even the president's table at the match day function is sponsored. 
Other clubs do not do this, maybe because they don't have the same opportunity, but everything that we own, everything that's ours, we look for the opportunity to leverage by way of sponsorship. So, of course, it won't surprise you that all our players are sponsored. All within the salary cap, don't worry about that. <laughs> Said I'm not going to give anything really sensitive away tonight. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with our tattooed wonder kid, Dane Beams, the boy that has the tattooed sleeve, he is our player that has the most player sponsors. He is a young gun. Now, question to you. Who do you think most of his sponsors are? Tattoo parlours? <laughs> tattoo parlours. Most of his player sponsors are tattoo parlours in Geelong and Melbourne. There's always an opportunity. So, sponsorship is a major form of income. It is, but I thought I'd also mention to you that it is also a major form of expense because there are so many things that get packaged up into sponsorship benefits. Every lunch, every meal, every player appearance, every item of clothing, every football that's signed. And we like to go out of our way to provide, <coughs> excuse me, benefits for our sponsors. So it's also a major form of expense for us. And for a long time, we didn't cost that properly. So, of course, that impacted the ultimate results for the club. And now we cost everything. And that's scary, but we're in a much better spot. More transparent. A couple of others I want to touch on. Merchandise. We are not the biggest sellers of merchandise. We would like to be. We should be. But it's hard. Retail is hard. So imagine, of course, we have a core business of playing football, but we're also supposed to be really good at retail. And there are lots of things that we've found that influence that. If you change a sponsor's name, guess what? We couldn't sell any jumpers earlier this year when we changed over to Aussie. We don't have parking at Lexus Centre, so people can't get into the shop. We don't have fashion items, if that's what you would call fashion items. We don't have a lot of them. We want to grow our online sales. That's a whole new strategy, a whole new investment. So yes, it is a major contributor. It is something we don't do well, and I would say it's actually a major opportunity for us and for many of the clubs. Corporate entertainment, we can charge from about $500 a ticket to corporates to come in and have a very nice lunch and hit some entertainment, listen to Ed speak and sit in a reserved seat. And of course, it, you only get the opportunity to do those things at home games, so we try and make the most of every opportunity. I need to mention the pubs. I'm not going to fess up completely, but pubs, clubs and pokey machines, ugh, they are an opportunistic source of income for football clubs in Victoria because we were gifted the licences to help us as not-for-profit sporting organisations generate revenue. Now, to me, this is a vexed issue. It takes specialist resources and expertise and a huge amount of time to properly manage these venues. So the opportunity does come hand in hand with enormous liabilities. And I think they are liabilities that are not very well understood by any of the clubs that operate these venues she says as a gross generalisation. And at the moment, of course, the industry is in turmoil. If any of you are experts, please tell me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you because it is a highly regulated industry. The middlemen have been pulled out in the tab corps and the tats and everybody now has to actually repurchase their licences for an amount that as yet has not been determined. So, Possibly a windfall, but at the moment, a huge investment of time and resources. We have our own travel agency. 
We have our own corporate leadership programs. Come and listen to Mick and run around our uh, oval and our training centre. And so on and so on and so on. Now, as Bill said, all of the clubs are not-for-profit organisations. And yet it's amazing how over time, and certainly more recent times, the expectations have now grown that we make a profit. There is an expectation amongst our members that we should make a healthy profit. In fact, some members have told me that there's obviously something very wrong at Collingwood because on a $64 million turnover, a profit of $2 million seems completely out of whack. If they were shareholders, they would say they're not getting the right return on their investment. But then we have to remind ourselves, at the end of the day, this isn't about business. This is about football. <laughs> now, I'm not going to scare you by going into all of our expenses, as I said. However, I do want to note that we effectively spend our operating profit on the football department. That's what we are there for. We are there for the sport. And last year we spent $16 million, more than $16 million on our footy department. So if we added that back into our profit, it would look more healthy. But again, we're there to support the footy department. So, a bit of insight into revenue and expenses. And of course, over and above financial considerations, we do all of the other business things expected of a board. And in my six years with the club, I've already seen in our club and in other clubs in the league an increased involvement and an enormous investment in lifting standards for good business. And they include things like governance and reporting, appropriate board composition. You'll note that they're not made up of all past players. Sophisticated transaction modelling and decision making. We don't always get it right, but boy, we do still run through the hoops. Licensing, publishing, broadcasting deals, stakeholder management. I'm sure all of them are familiar <coughs> to you in different ways as you manage your <coughs> businesses. But then we get to the really hard bit. We spend time as a board, with the executive and the football department, agreeing strategies to do what we can to prepare the best team. And yeah, we set strategic goals like winning a premiership in the next three years, which was our stated ambition for this year, 2010 and 2011. And having come from a five-hour board meeting last night where the poor football department was completely grilled about how we were going in terms of moving towards that strategy, I can tell you we do all of those things. Because at the end of the day, all of this business is ultimately for the purpose of winning the elusive premierships. And as we all know, Footscrays and the Collingwoods, sorry, Bulldogs, that it is hard. For the St Kilda supporters, many of whom have never seen a premiership in their lifetime, they know it is hard. So our off-field strategies can go some way to preparing the best team that we can. And then they run out onto the field and we cross our fingers and we cross our toes and we hope for the best. But we know that we've prepared them to achieve our combined ultimate goal of a premiership. Because we've got coaching staff, we've got development staff, we've got psychologists, we've got masseuses, we've got physiotherapists, recruiters, trainers, sports scientists, medical staff, a cook, a boot stutter, just to name a few. And we expect the boys, if it comes to your point, to dedicate themselves 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to our purpose of playing good footy. And to that end, we tell them what to eat, what to wear, when to run, how to kick. Believe it or not, that's not working too well at Collingwood. 
we are involved in their lives 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have state-of-the-art training facilities at Collingwood. That includes an altitude training room, an indoor kicking area. We've got this new whiz-bang screen, which is the size of the end of an oval where the boys can practice their kicking inside in case it's raining outside. Mm -hmm. And it tells them the ball dis distance and trajectory and whether it went through the goals. This is sport. This is what sport is. But to me, the real differentiation that morphs the business of football into a sport is the passion. And boy, at Collingwood, we've got a lot of that. Passion, passion. It would be so easy to be distracted. Firstly, every single person on that board, starting with our president, is a passionate Collingwood supporter, <coughs> prone to making quick decisions on the spur of the moment, but no, we have our business disciplines, we have our business structures. But we are overloaded with passionate responses from members, supporters, stakeholders and the media. The hysteria that follows AFL football is at times incredible and completely overwhelming. And Carlton is experiencing this in the last couple of days. The hysteria makes it even more important to use the structures and disciplines of business to make sure that we run our sport in a prudent way. Can you imagine being bombarded with emails, all of us, with having whole chat rooms dedicated to reviewing on and off field performance by the experts, having media coverage every day scrutinising your every move, having young men representing your business 24 hours a day, including when they were up to silly boy activities. And all of these things are reflecting on your business. They reflect on how well you are running your business, on the reputation of your business, and on the reputation of the industry that we're involved in. Yes, madam. actually discipline or manage them because of it. Based yes. On the yes, so yes, 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 yes. Now, every club has its own programs for educating the boys on the uh, way that their behaviour can impact the club, their fellow team members, their stakeholders, football as an industry, and themselves personally. What does it mean for their future? Now, every club does that. The AFL also does that. So they then attend different training with the AFL because they want to make sure that these boys understand the ramifications of their behaviour. Then, some of them actually have their own personal courses, and I would not say minders, I would say personal coaches, to help them. Stuff happens. At the football on Saturday night, Hulk Hogan, I think that's his name, visiting for the World Wrestling, was attending the game. Delightful older man. I was going to say young man. Um, I'm sure I'm not saying anything <coughs> wrong here, but uh, getting close to half time, having had a few drinks and enjoying himself immensely, two men in black came and tapped him on the shoulder. They said, it's time to go. Now, I said to the AFL guys, who were those two blokes? Were they your blokes or the MCC blokes or what's going on? He said, no, they're Hulk Hogan's blokes. <laughs> and they're there to tell him that it's time to go. And the reason they tell him now is because two more drinks, no one can stop him. <laughs> so they've got a whole system worked out. So it's not just the footballers, but it is an issue for sport. It is an issue for sport. So, they're the, the, the things that can be negative about passion. The other great things about passion, of course, it can be energising and uplifting. It can result in sales and sponsorship and membership and very much results in opportunities for our club 
and for the industry. So passion can be wonderful. But of course, with everything, you need to take the good with the bad. And is being on the board of a football club different to any normal board or other board that I am on, whatever normal is? Well, yes and no. Yes, because we focus on all the usual aspects of running a business. And no, because the sport overlay involves an obsession with premierships and passion, both of which are incredibly difficult to control. So it is a great conundrum because we would not have a business without the sport of football. But we certainly would not have football at the level we currently do here in Australia if it wasn't for the business that actually underpins its development. We can't be good with, without, sorry, can't be good at one without being good at the other. I think that's where we end up at the Collingwood Football Club. A real appreciation that we need to be excellent at the off-field functions for us to be excellent at our on-field functions. Sport is good for business and business is good for sport. So thank you very much for listening to me tonight and I'm delighted to take questions. Thank you very much. We start here. Could you say something about the proportions of the membership, uh, attendance and sponsorship in terms of their contribution to the overall revenue? Uh, well, if we're just talking about revenue, um, the gate receipts um, is, and membership, sorry, the two combined are definitely higher. Actually, if you took the three of them, gate receipts, membership and sponsorship, they all come in terms of uh, overall revenue. They make almost equal contributions in our club, which is actually quite high. But if you then build in the expenses associated with those lines of revenue, the membership is the most profitable for us. And to give you an idea, um, let's say the spend um, uh, for per member was about 220, I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying let's say if it was, um, the cost of that to the club is about $50. And so we have a very nice proportion of profit that is a higher proportion than the overall net benefit we get from sponsorship. And that's something that a lot of clubs haven't costed properly for a very long time. So there hasn't been transparency about the actual benefit of sponsorship into the club. It's actually been very interesting to go back and itemise each of the benefits that we ultimately give uh, sponsors. But another example on that is that for a long time, uh, and, and many clubs still do it, if you take a sponsorship, you are provided with signage at the ground. Now, of course, there's an opportunity cost of providing that signage as part of the sponsorship as opposed to actually getting somebody else to pay for that signage, and yet it's still very much bound up without actually being pr properly costed. The same with every meal. We do a lot of meals at Collingwood. We have this fantastic corporate sales and entertainment team, and in fact, when they're finished selling, as they will have done this weekend, packages to the football, we then get them selling packages to the Spring Racing Carnival by actually purchasing blocks uh, inside the winning circle, I think they call it, inside the track. And every concert that comes to Rod Laver Arena, we do packages to come and have a drink at Lexus Centre first and walk over. So we're looking to leverage uh, a lot of those um, costs um, but if they're not properly costed in the first place in terms of the benefits that we give the sponsors, then we actually don't have a true idea of the benefit back to the club. So it's become more sophisticated. How do you view the impact that the other two codes, such as rugby and uh, soccer, have on um, football? Uh, in particular, uh, that you have an international concept in the other two, but not so much in Australian rules? 
Well, you know, I don't think they make any difference. But um, no, it, it, is a, it is a serious issue um, and something that the AFL, which is really the guardian of our code, spends a lot of time on. And, and really part of the um, very important justifications for starting to build our code in the other states, so with the two new teams coming in in West Sydney and the Gold Coast, is very much around the considerations of how we grow support for our game. Uh, at Collingwood, we also, of course, have funded um, trips into Dubai, Ireland and South Africa. Uh, Essendon funds um, training and games into China. Melbourne has also done a lot with China. A lot of the clubs now are involved in, in different international programs. Um, the AFL is uh, keen on that to look to grow, grow interest in our game. We're of course interested because we might find some really athletic tall boys to come back and play footy for us. But it's a good, <coughs> it's a good uh, outcome. Soccer is growing. Um, interestingly, netball. And the growth in netball is also having an impact on the numbers coming to watch the game because um, women play a huge role in actually getting kids to games and families to games. Um, so I'm not going to be glib um, about soccer. Soccer is something that I think um, as a code and as a club uh, we're certainly very conscious of the impacts that the support for that game might have. We haven't seen it yet and uh, Collingwood was actually looking at some partnerships with soccer clubs just so that we could try to leverage uh, support for both and uh, see if we could balance out people having to make decisions between one and the other. In terms of rugby, uh, league or union really because they're both international of sorts um, we're not seeing any impact from that game on uh, on us. I think their average crowd um, has gone from 12,000 it's going backwards and uh, they've got some serious underlying issues. Mm. Now of course um, as a state we're all really excited about bidding for the World Cup soccer you can correct me if I get the terminology wrong. And um, we will all be involved. Um, uh, and I'm talking in terms of clubs because if we've got facilities, um, then they will be of value in a bid uh, for something like soccer. So we'll see times when we actually all work together. Um, and of course, the great thing about Victoria is we're so sports mad uh, that there seems to be good capacity for supporting all sorts of different codes and events. You know, the business of football is about business. It's also about football. Under the presidency of Mr. Maguire, Collingwood Football Club has become a very successful business model. How long do you think you can sustain this business model without winning a premiership or being <laughs> successful? <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, it's a, it's a really good question. It's the same question for all of the clubs. How long can we sustain this success if we don't actually win the main game? Um, you know, I cried over that for most of Saturday night. Uh, and um, it, it, it's a really interesting question because, um, you know, one of the, the great things about knowing that this game has been going for over 150 years, given that we celebrated that, was it last season? Um, is to show how long people can support clubs without having a premiership even every second year or even every 16 years. I mean, the St Kilda supporters, is it one premiership? And it was in 1966. <laughs> so it's not something that just faces Collingwood. Of course, we've been on a trajectory of success and that's something that we need to be very conscious of and they are issues that we discuss uh, often. Um, one of the great things I guess for Collingwood is that, um, not to boast, but uh, is that, that of all the clubs we've actually been in more finals <coughs> games uh, than any other club. So that's anything from the elimination finals onwards. Now for some supporters like me, I find that very frustrating. Uh, but of course when you talk to supporters whose team rarely gets to the finals, 
there's not that same feeling of satisfaction about how your team has performed, that feeling of elation when you win a home and away game. Uh, and so I think as long as we can, again, maintain that performance on the field, then that will go a long way to uh, ensuring the success of the club, regardless of who our president is or, in fact, who's on the board. So we probably have time for one more question. Okay. Oh, I'm not picking the last one. No way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Go on, Michael. Steve, up the back. You think we do a few more? You got time for a couple more? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay, we'll do. A, we'll we'll do a few more. You mentioned that your main goal is to win. Uh, well, your main goal really is to win premierships, and yet over the last so many years, the AFL has moved from 12 clubs to 18, presumably to increase uh, income and that sort of thing. But basically, that deprives the original 12 clubs of a premiership every three years. Now. Does Are you a statistician? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Does the board have an input into those sort of decisions? And if so, what would the board's view be? I mean, it's really trading off premierships for marketing opportunities or support. Hmm. Is this a closed discussion? <laughs> <laughs> well, most of the clubs had tantrums. You know, there are genuine concerns, particularly in difficult financial times about bringing two new clubs in. Um, the uh, decision to introduce two new clubs was extensively modelled by very well educated people at the AFL and therefore the um, results of that modelling were obviously compelling for many reasons. Uh, many reasons that were not necessarily shared by the clubs. But ultimately, if we believe that for the success of our sport and our code, that we do need to develop wider support across Australia and involve more people in the sport, then what is a lot of short-term pain, particularly around the draft, uh, is something that we all actually believe will deliver long-term benefits and so on the basis of that the clubs uh, agreed to it. If I could uh, paint the picture of the presentation questions good no questions great decided um, then that would give you a fairly accurate picture of uh, proceedings um, but um, no look we've all had a chance to actually uh, analyse and understand the information and uh, ultimately we do believe that it's in the best interests. The um, killer of the draft, of course, is that um, there are no 17-year-olds available. So that's about 25% of the good players uh, not available to be picked. And when our first pick is 14, um, there's really, you know, there's certainly not a ruckman available at 14. So, <laughs> so right up the back there. My my other rules, my, my three rules are take risks, tell people what you want, and create a support network to help you get there. And I tell myself those three rules every single day. So um, obviously there are lots of other things that can help guide careers. Um, but those three rules, one, I learnt them the hard way and therefore they're rules that I know very well and um, they've been very useful to me in, in how my career has panned out. Is that okay to leave it at that? Yeah. Well done. Right, back up there. Um, Scotch colours, I've got to pick him, two boys at Scotch. I just want to ask you about, <coughs> excuse me, something you mentioned at the end where you said that uh, for football to be enjoyable by everyone you need to be successful off the field and have the perfect business model and et cetera, et cetera. But I can't help to go back 50 years ago when uh, when footy players played for the passion, you know, just <coughs> ran out there on a Saturday afternoon and whatnot, and compare that to now where we have stop-start games, we're overrun by advertising, you can't watch a press conference without seeing a hundred different commercials. Don't you think maybe this business model is ruining football the way we know it? Hmm. Oh, look, I think that's an interesting perspective. I would go back, though, and say that um, having had some really great conversations with the guys uh, at the Players Association, 
um, that don't think that it was all roses uh, back in the old days in terms of the conditions that the guys uh, played in and the concern about you know, some of the issues that they faced. Um, has some of the romance gone out of football uh, as we've increasingly commercialised it? Um, and certainly I probably set myself up for that with all of the uh, descriptions of the sponsorships that we do. Um, maybe, it, maybe it has, but the opportunities that it has created for uh, players and certainly more players uh, for employment, uh, for growing our game and I, I think I would maybe say um, for ensuring that there is long-term long sustainability for our code, then uh, many of the um, um, initiatives and steps that have been taken, uh, certainly around the commercialisation issues that, that you raised, I think have been those things that have been able to support the, support the game. So some of them are annoying, you know, waiting for that stupid light to go off before the umpire bounces the ball. Um, but gosh, you know, I, I don't think it's because we've become more complacent that we put up with those things. And um, you can always buy paid TV and, and watch the game without commercials and things like that. So I think you do. I don't have paid TV, so I just presume you get to watch it uninterrupted. Um, so it's had some negative things, but I think overall it's been good for the game. My personal opinion. It's in the red tie. Back on uh, goal setting, and uh, you mentioned their three-year program, taking it to 2011. Interested to know if you, as a board, go out significantly further than just three years. And as part of that, are we doing enough from a AFL uh, team board perspective on junior football development? Well, when you see some of those incidents over the um, junior footy season and being a mum with two boys that play junior footy and seeing some of those sorts of things happening, I think it certainly deserves some attention. Uh, in terms of goal setting, the reason we said we need to win a premiership in three years is that we looked at our squad and where they are at and, um, and what the possibilities were and we believed that the next three years were the window for basically our current players. And we can go into lots of reasons uh, for that. But of course, we've had a core group playing together now for some time. And as we go into next year and the year after, they'll switch over, uh, click over the 100 games, which is sort of like this magic number. Uh, and certainly the three teams above us uh, on the ladder this season all had significantly more players in their squad that have that experience. and. Um, and that's why, you know, you get into these um, strategies of growing players and then you've got to give them time to get the experience and then you expect a lot out of them. And that's what we decided, that um, given the coaching situation as well, that our strategy needed to be that we've got to be very focused on a premiership in the next three years. Now, performance this year has shown some glaring uh, things missing. Uh, and they're things that we're addressing by saying, what do we need to put into our team? What skills do we need to put into that team to win a premiership now in the next two years? So it actually brings a focus to what we're doing. Now, if we were in a different situation, so if we were a um, Richmond, then it may be that our strategy is to say in the next eight years, because we might have decided it's going to take us that long to build up the team uh, to <coughs> achieve that premiership. But it's all about the premiership. It's all about... I mean, if you're in Melbourne as well, their horizons are much longer than ours and now much longer that Brock McLean's gone. Um, but they're the sorts of strategies. Now, when you are... <coughs> I didn't say in that, because we haven't won a premiership since 1990, but um, winning a premiership is so good for business. So as you focus on when you think you're going to win that premiership, you've actually got to then have your business objectives to one, complement, but actually tied to that on-field achievement as well. So tied to that are very aggressive off-field strategies around what we can achieve around numbers of members, turnover and profit. 
because if our team is performing well on field, then we need to be leveraging that performance to actually get the best results for us off field. And because of where our squad is, as I said, we've decided to put a three year time horizon about it. And we've been very public about that. Um, in terms of uh, long termism, I think that a lot of AFL clubs have to be long term. Uh, and in fact, bringing a shorter focus to our strategies was the first time certainly we'd done that since I'd been on the board. And that, that really brings an accountability with it, which we are very conscious of. Uh, so, so that uh, comes with it. And, um, with the juniors, I didn't bring any numbers. Uh, there are more juniors playing AFL football than ever before. So the junior leagues are growing. The Auskick is growing. Um, as somebody involved in junior club footy, can I say that um, probably one of the things being most keenly considered by the AFL at the moment is how much involvement now needs to go into junior football by the AFL. Because we are talking about volunteer parents with all sorts of different skill sets, other things going on in their lives, other commitments, trying to run these junior footy clubs coach them, manage each team, resource them, and it's not easy. So as the numbers swell, actually the issues for those junior footy clubs actually are exacerbated. And so I'd say for the AFL as they look at how they have been uh, growing involvement in uh, junior football, there, there comes a time for maybe uh, considering more responsibility for it as well. That's my observation, but... Um, we have time for one more. I understand Hulk Hogan's mind. I haven't is taken any anyway. so <laughs> uh, I haven't taken up. any from this side. We? Okay. Sorry. Um, I have more of a statement than a question. I work in oh, the department good. here and I'm a colleague with Medlar. And previous to my role here, I worked for um, Holden Special Vehicles and Holden Racing Team. Mm. So I was really interested in your comments about merchandise because mm -hmm. we had the exact same problems um, during my time there. What we did. Um, Oh, I've got a pen. What we did was um, consult with our member and customer list, about 50,000 people, and we got the overwhelming feedback. All our, um, the bulk of our merchandise was apparel. We got the overwhelming feedback that people wanted um, clothes to wear in their day to day lives when they're out at the pub and that sort of stuff. Um, so we, we delivered on that and gave them fashion wear, where the brand and the, the logo to a bit of back seat. Um, and I've always thought, being a colleague member, that they don't really do that so much, but our sales went through the roof. Well, that's, really oh, that's very good advice. I have tried to give them advice on fashion, <laughs> and it's gone absolutely nowhere. Um, but uh, the possibilities are endless, of course, for the clubs. Um, we don't actually control our merchandise. It's another very frustrating thing. The licensing is controlled by the AFL. They own all of the logos, yes. Um, we could possibly do something very tasteful like Bill's tie uh, because they can't own colours, um, but they do control all of the licensing for products. So they do all of that. Um, I mentioned licensing from both the AFL point of view. We would like to do some more of it. Um, and I'm sure we could take some good ideas to them. So in your part, your off time from Swinburne, maybe you could come and help us. Mm. I'm stunned to see fashion advice coming from the university. I have my own uh, take on uh, message from tonight, something that I've learned, which is the importance of thanking the sponsors and acknowledging the sponsors. Mm. So I'd like to thank tonight's sponsors, which are you, our alumni. Mm. Uh, without you, an event like this could not uh, occur. And uh, also, it's important to thank Bill for his introduction of Sally, and in particular to thank Sally for a fascinating and in depth view into the business of football. Um, I think the story, and I appreciate that Sally started with the history of the game and uh, also told us about her personal. Uh, passion for football and for Collingwood. And uh, she then explained the value of membership, gate receipts, uh, sponsorship, and in particular the centrality of that passion. I was struck by the uh, similarity with uh, running a university and the, uh, the importance for creativity in our courses and uh, the 
in shared basis as, as not-for-profit organisations, and the need always to raise funds to do what uh, really mm -hmm. matters, whether that be football or learning uh, or research. Uh, I think it's been a fascinating, terrific presentation, and uh, I hope that you'll join me in thanking Sally, who I'm sure you'll agree disproves the claim made by Mick Malthouse that uh, nobody in football should be called a genius. A genius is a guy like Norman Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sally. It's terrific. Really good. Oh, very nice.